Barbara, it is an honor to be able to uh, facilitate this talk with you, especially about two books that are very special to me as well. I remember the first time I read them was back in 2020, back when in the middle of pandemic, and it was a year for me of a lot of change, right? That's the year I decided to like give a little bit a turn on my career life, and both of your books really helped me a lot to, one, take that decision on taking that leap, and two, to help me navigate those new, um, that new adventure, right? On learning something that was totally different for what I was comfortable and familiar with. So I'm very happy and thank you for sharing all, all that knowledge with all of us that really gets to impact and help us grow a lot. So very happy here to share with you. And maybe we could start a, a little bit on learning about these two books. Can you tell us a bit about uh, A Mind for Numbers and Mindship? What, what are the main messages on both books that you would like to share with everyone? Oh, OK. So A Mind for Numbers, I, I had, um, I'd always struggled with math and science when I was growing up. In fact, I didn't like them at all. and. Um, so when I became a professor of engineering, one day one of my students found out about my terrible past as a former bad per person at math, and uh, he asked me how I changed my brain. So I wrote him a little email, and then I thought, well, you know, I like books. I think I, I like writing books, so I think there's actually more to dig into to here about how I changed my brain. So that's how I began writing uh, A Mind for Numbers. And, and then for Mindshift, I, um, I, I'm just fascinated by people who change careers, um, sometimes quite dramatically. And so it was a, a little bit of an attempt to explore. And um, actually, part of the book related to coming here to Guatemala and meeting uh, a member of UFM and interviewing him, Zach Caceres. So <clears throat> that's part of how I became friends with UFM. Awesome, and about Mindship, there are many uh, stories that you share in that book. Is there a particular story that you would like to, that is very meaningful to you, that uh, maybe the, the principles that that person um, used are uh, of great example for everyone to, you know, take a leap into another career or change career path? Is there a specific story of someone that you consider to be very uh, inspiring for others? So I think the story of Zach Caceres is a very inspiring story. He had difficulties in high school and um, ended up not actually graduating from high school, but he, he went, finally he enrolled at the university, I believe it was um, New York University, and um, he went through and and kind of became a successful learner. Part of, I should back up a minute. Um, he was not a good student, but he began studying music, and, and he began to learn how to play the guitar. And he was convinced that learning how to, you know, put, uh, learn sequential things, just as simple as how to play songs on the guitar, helped him to begin structuring his learning and his thinking. And so um, that began his help. But he had really thought he'd, he could never be successful. And then he graduated from the university quite successfully, except that at the very, very end, they found out by accident that he hadn't graduated from high school. So they made him go back and take the tests and so forth to show that he, which is kind of a silly regulatory thing when he or had already clearly shown that he could uh, be a successful learner. And you know, he, he, I think he graduated magna cum laude. But here's what Zach did since that time that I, uh, I don't think I've discussed in the book, he went and spent, I think it was around 10 months at a boot camp, learned how to program really well, and now he's a top programmer. 
So he changed from a political science background to being really, really good at programming. And it is so fun. Sometimes we will teach um, online seminars together about how to learn um, if you're learning to program well. And Zach, th he gets it. He, like, he knows how to speak with audiences and connect with really interesting stories and visuals. And he's not like most programmers that way. And I think part of it is this very unusual background. And that's often the case that people will bring very interesting insights from another career, a previous background, that they think, oh, that's baggage, it's all waste. But actually, it turns out to be really quite handy in this new thing that whatever uh, you're learning. For example, I know a, uh, a, a person who was a top musician and he decided to change and become a doctor. So I wrote about him as well. Uh, and he, th what they found was he knows how to listen to the heart rhythms of patients and he can hear in ways that the usually trained uh, medical school student could not. So he brought that really intriguing background from music, and it really helped him with what he was, oh, there's so many great stories of people who have changed. But I, I think it's a powerful, that this uh, provides powerful richness for society when you have uh, a, a culture and a, a country <clears throat> that allows for people to change careers because they bring so much richness with them. Yes, totally. And I think that also something that it's that is like a common denominator from all these people is their drive of learning, right? Their active curiosity, like not only staying in one area, but also asking, oh, what about programming, for example, or this doctor, what can, I, I wanna learn something more, right? So curiosity is kind of like these things that is a part of who they are, right? And right now, let's dive a little bit deeper about the process of, of changing, of learning something new or switching careers. What is What are like the most, um, the, the, what, what do you recommend? Like, what are the first steps someone can take in order to learn to do these big transitions? Like from your exam, from your experience, when you transition of being a linguist into being an engineer, what were the the challenges, and how do you tackle them, or how do a scientific a research have shown that are uh, um, important uh, strategies to tackle these new learning experiences? Well, changing your career and, and what you are specializing in, it's, um, there was a Harvard project called the, the Dark Horse Project that sort of studied people who were not expected to be successful, yet they turned out to be successful. But there's surprisingly little research on people who have made career switches like this. So I can, so that means I am safe in just regaling you with, uh, you know, individual op observations of the kinds of things that, that I've seen have helped people. So um, there, I think there's no one strict rule. Um, but one thing that really surprised me is that oftentimes, especially for young people, if you set your mind to do something or to, to change things, you, it's surprisingly often, uh, it's surprising how often people will, uh, um, your friends will discourage you from doing this. For example, the doctor I had mentioned, his friends, you know, he was, a, he, was, he was a really good guitarist. And his friends said, why would you do this crazy thing? Why would you go and study medicine? They didn't want to lose their friendship with him. They didn't want to say goodbye. And a lot of times, people will tell you um, the things that either you want to hear or that will make them happier. So they would say, don't be silly. Don't go off and study medicine. You won't be successful at that. They were very discouraging. 
And so he just stopped talking to his friends. He went off quietly on his own and began studying without saying anything because he didn't want anyone to discourage him. One thing that I think is fantastic that has emerged in the last decade has been the power of online teaching. To, so for example, for me, when I left the military and I wanted to change from someone who couldn't do math at all to someone who was successful at it, I had to stop my career, go to the university, take some years off. It took me, well, what, five years to go back and get a second degree in electrical engineering. But nowadays, you can start um, by going and taking courses online through, through a, a really good platform to go look at is called Class Central. And what Class Central does is, like there's Coursera, of course that's one of my favorites, uh, and edX is a good platform as well. Um, so there's many different online platforms, but what Class Central does is it, it analyzes all of these platforms. So let's say you want to learn Python programming. You can go and just look and see what are the top ranked courses in Python programming. It's a little bit like those Amazon reviews. So, uh, so it's, it's really a lot better now if you want to like dabble in something. And if you're a young person and you just want to explore a little bit, you can actually go look at a university programming course at a top university like Harvard or UFM. <laughs> and, uh, and, and you can learn about your, uh, whatever you're interested in without necessarily making a, a dramatic big sacrifice or a leap of career. So I think nowadays it, it's, it's better, it, it's easier. And you use Class Central to find the best courses because it doesn't, people will often tell you, oh, you've got to have a great, uh, a face-to-face -face teacher. But they don't tell you that half of all teachers are below average. And if you have a face-to-face -face teacher who's not that inspiring, they're not nearly as good as a person who you see only on video, but they love what they're doing and they really you know, have put passion into developing a great course. Yes, actually, that's how I started when I decided, a couple of years ago, I decided to take a master's in finance and it was like very scary for me because I studied education at the MPC, so why would I enter that world of so much formulas and structure? So actually that's how I began. I, 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 instead of using Coursera, I searched for many courses in Udemy. So I studied for like half a year. Half a year I was like looking through online courses and reading things and I think it is a very safe way of testing if you like or not a topic, right? Because they have tests and everything. So it's a good way of testing ourselves if, do I really want to get there or no, <laughs> right? So I think it is like um, an also cheap way <laughs> of, 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 of testing, right? To see if, the, if there is interest or not and then taking a higher leap, right? So that is an um, excellent um, tip, right? For changing or learning something new. So right now I would like to connect about mind shift to a mind for numbers because I, I, from my perspective, though these two books connect really well one to another, right? Mind shift is about like your mindset, and then a mind for number is also mindset, but at the same time, like how do you um, take action, right? Like how can you use all this chunking and and all those strategies to uh, learn something difficult? In this case, um, numbers, right? I know if you'd like to share a little bit about. Um, about how can you use chunking or um, the diffuse and, and, and focus mode to when, when you learn something new and especially things that are difficult, such as math, for example? So it's, it, it's only in the last 20 years, there was, they were doing experiments where they're looking inside brains and they were trying to figure out like if we're doing math, what part of the brain gets used? 
if we're doing, if we're reading, where is the brain activated? If we're playing a piece of music, where is the brain activated? So they were doing all of these tests involving specific tasks. Well, one day, they were doing some tests with these specific tasks, and they told the person, okay, just, just wait here for a minute while we load the new task on. And so the person was doing nothing. But it turns out when they were supposedly doing no task at all, the brain was very active. In fact, it had a very broad network of, of connections that suddenly appeared. And this network was quite distinct. It's like it relates front and back and some of the temporal lobes. So it's really a broad network, whoops. And, um, and this network, oh, thank you. This network um, is, um, it, um, is quite different than the more restricted tasks for a specific task you know, that you're working on. So, um, so they, neuroscientists labeled this the default mode network, this very broad sort of uh, network that happened, that arose when you supposedly weren't thinking about anything in particular. And now we know, it's, this is quite intriguing to me, when you're doing retrieval practice within, uh, you know, and you're retrieving, in other words, re you're remembering something out of your own brain, guess what? You are accessing this default mode network. And part of what's happening is you're turning out, you're turning off your access to the outside world. You're not paying attention to it. You're looking internally. And, and so this is, uh, anyway, this is a network very much related to creativity, but it's also the network, let's say I'm focusing on something really busy and I get stuck. So I go off and go for a walk or I, I'm, I decide to make dinner or I just do something, you know, different. That, during that time frame, this default mode network will will activate and it will start processing what you're stuck with. And it will kind of start figuring things out. So later on, when you go back to what you were stuck on, suddenly it makes sense. So when I was a little kid, nobody ever told me when I couldn't succeed at doing math problems, they didn't say, oh, you just go and take a little break allow your diffuse mode, your default mode network to work in the background, and when you come back, it will make sense. Nobody ever said that. And so, um, and they didn't even know that back in the day. And so I just thought, oh, if I can't figure something out, like, like the super smart people who actually had a lot more experience with the math, then I must not be good at math. Instead of saying, oh, I just need to take a break and let the back of my brain sort of figure things out. So um, going, it, we often make the mistake of thinking that we only learn when we're in that focus mode, but that's really not true. It's you, you learn some when you're focusing, but you also learn when you're just relaxing and taking a break. And we don't, because we don't recognize that, we often like spend too much time focusing. When I'm in Asia, for example, I, I am often told by teachers in Asia, we have a real big problem here because our students are not very creative. I can't help but wonder if that is true, that it might be arising because um, Asians, uh, at least in the countries I've gone to, for example, in Singapore, they are so industrious and hard work, working and focused that they can focus all the time. And that can, uh, there's some research evidence that that suppresses the activities of this creative default mode network. So it may be that they're just like focusing too much, trying too hard to be really, really good students. And, and it can help you be a good student, but it doesn't help so much with 
stepping back and thinking a bit more creatively about things. Yes, definitely. I think that in the diffuse mode, that's where you see like the big picture, right, of, of everything. And then you can see how the little pieces of things you're trying to learn kind of fits into the whole puzzle. Right. So, yeah, I think it is very, very important like to take breaks. I think that's one of the biggest um, learning skill that I took away from your from your MOOC when the first time I, I took it back then in, in when I was at the MPC and it really changes a lot, right? And I also think that chunking is a, another very excel, excellent tip, especially when you're learning something new. I mean, it, I think the chunks, I, I was thinking about this to this morning, about how chunking is different in, the, in each phase of when you're learning something. When you're starting learning something, chunking is very related to vocabulary, for example, like trying to understand the different vocabulary from the different fields you're in, right? I mean, like every area, every field has its own wording. And so you, like the first thing is like, okay, on, let's understand what, the, what, what everything means, right? And then as you get building mastery and expertise on the topic, then chunking becomes different. Maybe it is not memorizing, but connecting and then building on, on the connections you did. So it is like how in different phases of learning, like the chunking works differently. That so that's kind is of a like very a perceptive. <laughs> I think that's quite true. I mean, in its simplest way of thinking about it, chunking is, for example, let's say I learn I'm learning to play a song on the piano with one finger. So first I'd learn, okay, I press this key here. Then I'm learning to play the song. So I go, oh, I go like that, several different da, 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 da. So I'm, I'm learning a sequence of notes. That sequence is a chunk. So first of all, it might be like pressing one key is a chunk. Then two keys, da, da. You know, that's the first, then dun, 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 dun. So I, my chunk is getting bigger. Um, then I m begin to learn more complex things. So my chunk is becoming larger and larger. So let's say that I am trying to say Zdrastitia in Russian, which is just hello. I might start with the smallest Zdra, Zdra, that, that little syllable, and that's the first chunk. But when I practice enough, it, it all comes together, and it's zdrasitye, kak vu pozhivayitye, how are you? So it's, it's the same in learning all sorts of languages. You, you learn a small chunk, then bigger chunks, and then you begin to learn how the chunks play with one another. So for example, how you conjugate a verb. Uh, how do you um, how do you say sentences, full sentences, and so forth? So developing um, those chunks from small bits to larger is a key aspect of learning. But a good idea, whenever you encounter something and you're just lost, try to break it into a smaller chunk. Find a way. So, for example, I have a friend, and he was starting with with. Um, calculus in college, and he just realized this is way beyond me. I, so he went back and started reviewing little chunks of his high school math so that he could bring those chunks back to mind and then um, make more sense of what he was learning. So the development of chunks, you have to build this... Um, like, let's say you're, you're learning how to, um, so you learn the multiplication tables. At first, you're just learning it chunk by chunk. Two times four is eight. And you're learning all these little chunks. But later, as you practice with these chunks, it becomes one larger chunk. You actually kind of understand how these numbers relate to one another. And that chunk, the multiplication table chunk, informs as you begin to deal with fractions. And fractions make more sense because you have those previous chunks. So w as you're building, you have these simplistic chunks. They build to higher and to higher levels. But sometimes educators will say, you should be 
asking questions only at the top of Bloom's taxonomy, you know, the highest and most difficult level. It's kind of like, I'm sorry, but you can't get there without all of these underlying chunks. I can't speak a language unless I've got, you know, the access to all that underlying vocabulary as well as the grammatical structure. I can't feel comfortable with, um, with higher level algebra unless I've really become comfortable with the underlying chunks. So uh, this idea of chunks is a really interesting one. But one point is there's even a paper that is about the fact that the word chunk can have so many different meanings. Because chunk can mean, you know, like a, a chunk of a textbook. It can mean a set of neurons in the brain. Um, there's actually a really good paper that says, for many words, um, a typical word has between 20 to 30 different meanings, and we're often completely unaware that a person is using a word in a certain sense, and we interpret it in another. For example, um, Carmen and Daniela were talking to me about the collab today, and I was like, okay, now wait. Now, I know how you are using the word collab is not how I'm, I'm understanding it as this place. And they're like, no, 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 it has some, it's way more than just that. And that's, you know, so as you're speaking with people, try to be aware of how often people will say something and then you tend to go, yeah, but they mean something and you mean something quite different. And sometimes that can result in, um, you know, real uh, challenges for people. Yeah, definitely, to understand what, what each of us mean by what we're saying, right? And I also found the chunking concept to be very powerful because sometimes we are in places where the teachers begin in a very high, uh, complex level, right? For example, in master's degree, I, t I believe it tends to be a lot like that, right? They begin in a very intermediate to advanced um, a kind of level. So if you have no idea of what a, 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 on, on the field, like in my case, I never work anything related to corporations or, or numbers before. So beginning there, it was like intermediate to advanced kind of level. So it was like, okay, how do we go backwards? <laughs> right? Yes. Like, okay, so this is the, the huge topic. How do I build up these, the knowledge, right? How do I uh, understand the, the building blocks, as you were saying, and like kind of by myself or asking for help, how can I start building all these small concepts to get to understand these big um, concept, concepts, right, that the teachers were, were, were teaching. I think that, and, and I think that in many cases, it, it is like that, like uh, when a, a student chooses a, a career, a, a major degree or something, they might not, learn about that at school so it is for them how can okay so how do we build these um these chunks right these building blocks and sometimes teachers some teachers can help better others that have more experience right so they can maybe it relies more on the individual responsibility of students to also build those uh, those blocks themselves so yes so I would like to maybe ask, uh, do a little activity with, with our guests. So I don't know if you guys can um, get into groups of five people and ask about how do you guys implement these learning strategies we have been discussing so far in your personal life or in your classes. So maybe we can share a little bit after, after that. So don't be shy. <laughs> We're going to have five minutes for this. So please, if someone from each from your group can share what you guys uh, talk about, please raise your hand so Gabby or Marcela can give you the microphone. So we're recording this, so we need to <laughs> make sure that we can hear you. Who would like to start? Hi, thank you so much. We were wondering if uh, there is something like a correct order in which uh, we have to develop certain habits. For example, we have this example you mentioned from Singapore, where people tend to concentrate too much, maybe too much. 
on a, on a given task, they are too industrious and they like to concentrate. Uh, so they start losing creativity abilities. And then we have uh, the, um, well, the, this, this more relaxed way of thinking, the diffuse mode. Uh, but what is the correct order to learn those habits? Should we start by teaching people how to concentrate and stay focused on a, on a, on a certain task and then uh, to move to the diffuse mode? Or maybe we should start by the diffuse mode, learning how to relax the mind and how to think of many things and then teach how, the, how to concentrate on things? So uh, that is such a good question. I, I think I, I've thought a lot, in fact, I'm working, just beginning work on a paper now that relates to, um, you know, the best of all education, I feel, is a melding of Asian, Eastern, and Western approaches to learning. I think there is a great deal of benefit to focusing intently and gaining, you know, kind of practicing enough that some things come without you even having to think about them because you've laid these, um, these sort of very habitual patterns of, of thinking and learning about things. Um, but also, there's so much to be said for that Western approach, which is, you know, we, we spend a little more time uh, in diffuse mode, people aren't fully concentrating all the time. I think that when children are learning, actually there's good evidence, they don't focus at all. <laughs> you know, the, the, their little minds are kind of like mosquitoes. They, they don't have much working memory, but how is it that they're able to learn language? And part of the way they do this is they are piecing together tiny chunks. They become aware that, for example, in English, you might have uh, run, r that that R-U-N is a typical way of putting letters together. If you're learning Russian, it might be um, yet. <laughs> You know, there's n, y, that's a more typical sound. In Spanish, you might have señor. So it's a, you know, you've got more the, you will learn to expect certain sounds. And it is funny because our little granddaughter, she is exposed to some Russian. She's exposed to Spanish from her Chilean daddy and English from her mommy. And then she has uh, exposed to French, Mandarin, and some Russian as well, because it turns out a family friend is Russian. And when I speak to her in Russian, she's like, oh, Grandma, this is weird. You're supposed to be speaking English, you know, uh, because she, she's already developed an expectation. Actually, I have another friend who's a neuroscientist who is a Swiss, so she speaks German, French, and English, but she lives in the States. Her daughters have always heard her speaking German to them. And when her brother came to visit, her daughters were like, wait a minute, no, he can't speak German. Only women speak German. They, they picked up this idea that only women spoke German because that's all they'd ever heard you know, from her and her sisters and so forth. So we, we learn expectations you know, about now, uh, let's see, we were, we were going, let's see. So now I'm revealing my bad short, my bad working memory. Now how, I was wrapping this back up into your question again. Now what was the, the question? <laughs> so, so I really, you know, because children just learn without focusing, um, they're already learning things, and by the time they get into school, nobody's saying, okay, focus first and then do things. And actually, as they develop, they get a little bit bigger working memory, and you kind of have to get a working memory to be able to focus. So um, I, I think we can't really go wrong either way that we tell kids to learn, but oftentimes, if they do have enough working memory capacity that they can focus, 
it's a good idea to focus on something first and then let that default mode network, diffuse mode work in the background when they might get stuck. So it, because if you don't have anything there that you've focused on in the first place, it's, it's a little hard to know, you know, be putting things together. So, you know, I, I think normally it's kind of like you front load with focusing, you get something into the prefrontal cortex and then allow that to process and, and um, there, there's good evidence during that default mode activity time is when the brain is also like um, trying to make connections and prune away connections that aren't needed. So, um, so front load first with focus, but don't forget to do some relaxing afterwards. But do that relaxing without looking at your cell phone because if you've learned something during that focus and then you focus on your cell phone, you're actually gonna be overriding some of the things. And that is, I think, one of the challenges we have in society today. People are so used to not being bored by grabbing their cell phone whenever they have a spare moment that they don't get used to just letting that default mode network you know, work away. So it's, it's a very, it's not a bad idea at all. For Bill Gates, for example, his daughter didn't get a cell phone until she was 14. So, and there's good recent evidence that uh, too much exposure to cell phones, or, you know, to having these kinds of multimedia, or, you know, kind of um, uh, social media kinds of things actually developmentally delays children. So, um, so we need to be aware of that, that actually it can be a little dangerous for kids. Awesome. Someone else would like to share some insights? Just, just some thoughts then on... Just the, the mic. What happened, uh, I'm sorry. First of all, you, you can teach all dogs new tricks. <laughs> um, I'm a witness to that. At uh, a prior uh, conference of yours, you suggested to us that to be to help focus, we could use this application on the phone. Maybe just like to expand on it. So because I did download it, I've been using it, and uh, over the last four or five days, I found it wonderful to be. Oh, okay. Is that Brain HQ or the Pomodoro technique? Um, <laughs> He's the got the key F -O -C -A, idea. FOCA, 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 F, which came from uh, a site that you gave us, um, which uh, teaches how to focus and how to learn better. So th it, that might be the Brain HQ. Does this have to do with um, the kind of? It's Pomodoro. Oh, it's Pomodoro. Okay. So, so there are actually, so what Guy was doing was doing exactly as I suggested, which was go out and look and find an app for the Pomodoro technique. And there are so many out there and there's really a lot of good ones. The Pomodoro technique is where you, you just, um, it's, a, it's a way of using both focused and diffuse modes. So you, you first get rid of all distractions, so nothing pop up, popping up on your computer, nothing, no, no cell phone ding-dongs or anything like that. And then you uh, focus, you set a timer for 25 minutes, focus as intently as you can for those 25 minutes, and then take a five-minute relaxing, rewarding break. And this, um, this technique, I have to say, so, uh, my husband and I created, uh, along with Terry Sanowski, the course Learning How to Learn. And in this course, um, what it's one of the most, I was just at Coursera in uh, California and they said, do you know it's still, it is our most popular course. Uh, I was shocked and it's had millions of students and they write to me and they say, 
we love your course, and one of the most popular things from that course is that I, we teach about the Pomodoro technique. People just find this incredibly useful. And in fact, if so uh, the big thing is procrastination is one of the biggest blocks around to learning. You just, it's like, yeah, I'm gonna do this later. But if you, uh, if you just sit there and say, oh, okay, yeah, I know I wanna procrastinate because you actually get a pain in your brain in the insular cortex whenever you think about something you don't wanna do. But if you just go ahead, move past that and set a timer and do a Pomodoro of 25 minutes. Anybody can do a Pomodoro of 25 minutes. And, and what's cool about this technique is that, for one thing, it, you know, it, we know from neuroscience, if you just block out distractions, that's a huge help to focusing better. But we've also learned that if you start working on something and you work on it for 25, 20 minutes, that pain in the brain because you didn't want to work on it, it goes away. So, so it's like this Pomodoro technique is beautifully constructed to get you over that hill of, you know, I don't want to do something, to get you kind of into the flow of doing something. And people just really love it. And what's amazing to me is I could tell you know, I knew that Pomodoro was helpful for, for, for me, and it was also helpful for, um, you know, people I knew and so forth. There is shockingly little research on, directly on the Pomodoro technique. So everything about it says, yes, it's really helpful. But I think because it's just been around for so long, the researchers are like, well, that's not cool to research. So they don't research it. But boy, if you use this technique, you will find it's really effective. And it's also kind of fun because you can use these apps. Uh, for example, Forest is a very popular um, Pomodoro app. And if you, you know, if you complete a Pomodoro, you plant a tree, at least metaphorically. And if you don't, you kind of kill a tree, at least metaphorically. So uh, it's, it's kind of fun. It's like collecting badges. Yes, and adding to what you're saying, I think that the Pomoro technique also helps tackle procrastination because, as you were saying, sometimes we procrastinate tasks because we believe they're really gonna, they're hard or we don't, or that it's gonna take us a lot. So if we chunk them down in 25 minutes, we see like a, you know, like a light in, in, in the end of a tunnel, so it's, oh, it's just 25 minutes. Let's just work on this 25 minutes. Let's uh, then I don't know. I will go for an ice cream and then we'll come back. So you see that there is uh, a pause that 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 it will somehow somehow kind of end. So it is not gonna, I'm not gonna be here for three hours or four. Just 25 minutes and then we keep moving moving forward. So oh yeah, that's 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 cool. So you guys, we can give ourselves a little reward after 25 minutes of achieving something. I don't know, someone else would like to share some insight or questions? Thank you, Barbara and Shady. So in our little group, we talked about how to learn to not to assume stuff. I learned it from the master sitting right here <laughs> in the office. Um, and I guess the question that, ar that arose from this little talk that we had was, how can we ask better questions or taking into consideration that everybody has a different brain, how can we ask questions with a little bit more clarity between two different brains that operate differently? Use chat GPT. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a fan. So, you know, I say that jokingly, but actually, it, I mean, you might even, like, whatever you want to ask a question about, just, just ask it and say, what's the best question I, I could be asking about this? Or uh, you might put your question through and say, what's wrong with the way I phrased this question? One thing I did was I, so I wrote a paper on learning styles. And I'm, I'm actually looking at the neuroscience 
underneath learning styles, and I'm kind of like, wait a minute, all these psychologists are writing about learning styles, but they're just playing with definitions. There's actually some really cool stuff from neuroscience that indicates there are learning styles. But as soon as you might indicate that, they'll say, oh, it's not a learning style, it's a cognitive style. Uh, uh, so it's kind of funny. But I put my paper into chat GBT and said, uh, can you criticize my paper? And it said, well, one of the things you did was you you were a little bit um, unnecessarily antagonistic towards those who were, uh, you know, learning style debunkers. And, and I, it, that was kind of transparent to me. I, I wasn't aware of that before, and it really helped um, open my mind to, uh, oh, <laughs> well, I guess I was part of it. I left in anyway, but, uh, but it was very informative in helping me reframe how I was looking at things and how I was even asking the questions. Great, someone else would like to share something, a question inside? We talk, we talk about different uh, techniques that you recommend, but since I have the microphone, I can ask my own question. <laughs> um, when we, you were talking about chunking and, and Shady said something like, the teacher in a master's level has big chunks because actually has mastered the topic. Um, it, there's kind of a challenge for a teacher to think on the correct size of chunks for the students, because we are all so much over that level. Uh, we have a game mastery, we have experience, and uh, sometimes we feel that the chunks that students are, are dealing with may be very too simple. Or may, how can we go back like if it were Legos, we could go to the basic Lego and understand the proper size of the chunk for the level of the student and not for the level of the teacher because we, we have all that baggage behind. I, I think this is, that's such a great question and it's one where I really, I have this wonderful visual I wish I had brought with me that I could show here. So this is where, so let's say, for example, I am teaching about electrical circuits. So when I say chunk, I really mean part of the, the schema, the framework that I have of my expertise in long-term memory. So when I'm thinking about electrons, I'm thinking in part about these little bundles of energy. So when I'm explaining to students about the flow of electrons, I'm thinking, bundles of energy moving along, right? But what students are thinking is like, and then she's talking about, you know, they don't really have a, a, a grasp of what I mean when I'm saying electron. So, um, so the thing to do is, uh, so I'm explaining, I'm doing the best I can, but then I put students in groups. And within those student groups, I say, okay, now I want you to uh, explain to one another the key idea that I just explained. For example, I might do something like that. So there'll be, you know, the students will be sitting there, she's talking about, you know, this thing. And one of them says, you know, I think it's kind of like crowds of people moving along. And so she's, what she's really talking about, it's like crowds of people and, and when they slow down, when it gets like a tighter, um, you know, so there's more resistance in this area. So they are drawing from their neural schema, their long-term memory, and they are deducing that a metaphor f that is equivalent to what I'm using, which is bundles of energy, is just like people in crowds. And actually, it works you can get a, a sort of a rudimentary understanding of electrical current flow by thinking about it as groups of people. And in fact, if you look at some of the most brilliant um, Nobel Prize winners, for, for example, Barbara McClintock, when she developed the jumping gene uh, theorems that allowed her to win that Nobel Prize, she would imagine the genes as kind of like whole people standing there 
And, uh, and that's how she worked with, that's how she imagined what was going on. So in any case, a good thing to do to get past that sort of teacherly block of my memories involve much higher level, so to speak, concepts, is to allow students to come together and draw from you know, a metaphor that allows them to at least get a step into understanding the key idea that I'm trying to convey. And it turns out, whether I'm talking about electrical um, you know, bundles of energy, or they are thinking of crowds of people moving along, when you do the analysis, our brains are actually in sync when they have got the key concept and they are, and, and when they understand the concept and do really well on tests, our brains are in sync even though they're drawing on a different starting metaphor from their, their uh, neural schemas. So, it's, so use the power of, of um, allowing your students to kind of brainstorm ideas that work for them and then you will learn what ideas work from them and then in the future you can kind of use that as well as your own pre-existing knowledge. Great, that, that reminds me of an activity, activity that we do a lot in Formación Continua, that is like mind mapping, that is like to make your students like map out their, their, their knowledge, right? So you can see what's in their mind and how they're understanding topics. I think that could also help a lot, right? To, under, to see how they're understanding things. And I don't know if someone else have another inside question. Thank you so much. Well, uh, uh, one of the amazing things about your story is that you uh, develop these uh, math skills uh, later in your life. <laughs> and I was wondering, is, is there uh, like something, something like the opposite process where a person that has many mathematical skills uh, in, in their job, uh, they, are, they, they excel at math or physics in, in maybe in middle school, but later, they are so used to excel at those uh, topics that when they reach university, for example, they start struggling with uh, topics like history, philosophy, economics, maybe. Uh, is, is there something like um, a story like yours, but in the opposite way? Um, so, oh, that's such a good question. Y oftentimes, students who are really, really talented get to the university and that's where they begin to struggle because they haven't developed the learning skills. But let's, um, let's so a f actually a friend of mine who recently passed away is Cormac McCarthy, who was the, he won the Pulitzer Prize for um, No Country for Old Men, um, All the Pretty Horses. He was an absolutely brilliant writer. Do you know he started as an engineer? So he was, you know, and he just was, he, he wanted to, he, he, he was really good at doing engineering and all of these kinds of things, but he just felt this calling to become a writer. And I'm convinced that part of the reason he was such a brilliant writer was that he looked at things a little bit from an engineering perspective, but he's had this beautiful way with words that was absolutely uncanny. And, uh, um, very dark way of telling stories that is uh, quite different than uh, the way engineers, you know, can't tell stories usually like that. So yeah, absolutely, people can go both ways um, with their their learning. That's that, that's, a, that's a great question, Leonel. <laughs> so does someone else have have something else to ask? Um, well, very enlightening, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering, when talking about like mind shift and like changing careers, is there, um, like for, for example, survivorship bias that we should take in, uh, into account um, when like attempting a career change or uh, something? Oh, I was asked not too long ago about survivorship bias you know, which is basically, we, we only see the ones who lived, <laughs> you know, and survived in that. 
But actually, I, 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 I couldn't help but retort, uh, evolutionary uh, biology, we're alive because of survivor bias. Uh, you know, so there actually kind of is something to, um, you know, is it cherry picking uh, when you have some results and not others? Um, I think that the, the fundamental issue goes down to the, the question of um, y you, you're looking for something to be successful at. And, um, and sometimes it's just not gonna work. And there's some evidence from evolutionary biology that depression may arise from sort of nature's way of telling you, shut down because you're not being successful at this and maybe you should change the direction you're going in. Um, but uh, I, I think that you know, it's it's like those movies sometimes where they'll make fun of the person who has this super optimistic uh, attitude about everything and they just always keep going until they go right into the ground because you can't always be successful at everything and you can't always have this happy-go-lucky attitude that everything is gonna work. But it, uh, I think that if you, you know, the smartest thing we can do as humans is just try to intelligently um, you know, adjust um, and, like for me, I, I love writing, um, but at the same time, I, I've written a number of books. Some of them were not successful at all. Some, some nobody was interested in. I think they were really interesting books. I mean, there was one about a, um, a, a, a a killing that happened in Utah, and uh, it was all about sort of uh, the the killer and how she would marry guys or go out with guys, and then when she didn't like them anymore, she would just kind of inject them with too much. At, at least evidence shows that she would inject them with heroin or whatever and kill them and then go on and move to the... I thought this was a fantastic, it's a fascinating way of, of exploring how people can, can appear to be doing good even while they're actually doing some really harmful things. But, you know, that wasn't of interest to people. So I just kept going and working on other books and Sometimes authors will often say it's just it's a, a complete surprise the book that they thought was never going to be really anything big at all. I mean, think about it. a book called A Mind for Numbers that is like the most boring name for a book. When when Penguin said we're going to name your book A Mind for Numbers, I just thought, wow, well that's not going to go anywhere. The most common. T um, place that you will see the phrase a mind for numbers is in obituaries. And uh, so, you know, I just thought, well, this book's gonna go nowhere. And yet this one was, uh, it sold well over a million copies around the world. Uh, and people are really interested in learning. So I, I was just completely surprised. But they, they say the biggest thing about being creatively successful is just doing lots of stuff. So I like to say do lots of quality stuff, um, but uh, you know, there's no guarantee. There are people I have known who are absolutely brilliant and they, you know, they haven't had that lucky success. And I realize I've had some lucky successes, um, but we all just keep trying and uh, do the best we can. So uh, you know, I've certainly been you know, really lucky uh, as well as worked hard to, to come up with some of these creative. But I do think that part of the reason that I have been lucky is that I was willing to do lots of different things and be very uncomfortable sometimes because it gives me a way of looking at things that like I can bring in these insights from working on Soviet trawlers on the Bering Sea or you know, at the South Pole Station or having served in the army or uh, you know, just lots of different perspectives that people often just don't normally have. So it's not like I'm this 
incredible genius like my colleague, Terry Sanowski, who I think is an incredible genius. It's just that I've had all these experiences so that even a normal person like me can do really well and be very creative just because of all these really unusual experiences. Yes, and also adding to what you're saying and something that you highlight a lot in your book, Mindshift, is the is of not being afraid of mistakes, right? Of embracing mistakes that is also part of this journey of learning and transitioning into whatever we, we want to do, right? So we have time for one last minute. Who would like to wrap up the Lisa. Q&A? Lisa. Lisa. Yeah. OK, I, um, I was just going to, I have one comment and, and a question. The comment is, we give a lot of um, emphasis to, in co-creation to the sourcing um, knowledge from people from different perspectives. Sounds like you co-create within your own mind with all these perspectives that you, you bring from your, your past. The question was, why, why did you choose electrical engineering coming from a linguist um, background and when you knew that math was not your thing? Uh, well, part what was the attraction? was um, electrical engineering was the, it is, I think, the most heavily mathematical engineering discipline. And engineering was, there's nothing more alien to my personality than engineering. And there's nothing more alien amongst engineers than, than I mean, the furthest you could get. And I just thought, wouldn't it be fun? You know, wouldn't it be bizarre if I could become an engineer? And uh, so it was kind of a bit of an intellectual challenge. But I was lucky to be living in a society that where I could take this risk. Um, it was scary trying to do it because like the first year, I remember just, you know, I'd be sitting at a coffee shop studying and looking with longing at the people who were clearly much further ahead of me. And I was like, am I ever really going to be able to make it? And uh, But just piece by piece, I still remember this one guy. So um, I mean, I studied really hard. And at that time, calculators had just come out. And so he. Uh, um, there, you could program your calculator so it could have a lot of stuff in it. But I never did that. I just used it for the numbers. But he, he borrowed my calculator, and then he cleared it. And so if I had been doing any kind of hanky-panky, you know, because I, I always did better than him. And, uh, and uh, he borrowed it and cleared it and handed it back, looking very smug. And I was like, OK, well, how do we get this back on? And it didn't bother me at all. And I still aced the test. And I still remember he was just like, I'm sure she was cheating. You know? Uh, uh, so uh, yeah, it was, I don't know. Sometimes it's fun to just try to pick a, 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 an intellectual challenge. So I thank you so very much this evening. This has been a wonderful evening with great questions. And I, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to share with you. And I guess we're, we're going out to dinner tonight. So, uh, so I've been told that I have to make sure I'm done at 6.30. So is it, uh, is our? Yes, we have 10 more minutes. OK, <laughs> so we're good. very on time. Okay. <laughs> So thank you, Barbara, for sharing uh, uh, with us this evening and for your books and all the work you put out, right? I think it is very useful in now, more now more than ever, right? Since the world is changing so fast, things are, new things are arising, and we really, with all those tips and techniques, really help us get into the, f into the future, you know? Like, learn anything we, we want to, and definitely. So uh, if you're a young person or, or a, a middling, you know, in middle, if you're already at the impact stage of your career, then you can enjoy where you're at. If you're still working towards that, try to not be afraid of doing things that are really harder. Um, if, you, if you think about, you know, if you feel really uncomfortable, you feel like a fake, feel like an imposter, 
welcome to the club. That's how I've felt for decades, and it's helped me to be successful because I never felt like, oh yeah, I can rest on my laurels, right? So uh, now I'm, I just, I'm so excited, and I'm really excited for the future of Guatemala because that's why I'm here. Is I just, I feel so closely connected to UFM and to the future that you hold within your hands. Thank you.